is a Corey, and I'm from the United States, California. And uh, my topic, what I speak about, is uh, one of the most vitally important issues of our age, and that is United Nations Agenda 21, Sustainable Development. And uh, as I'll be talking about tomorrow, it is the inventory and control plan. Inventory and control of all land, all water, all minerals, all plants, all animals, all construction, all means of production, all food, all energy, all information, and all human beings in the world. And this is a plan that was agreed to by 179 nations back in 1992. It's a United Nations plan. It's called the Agenda for the 21st Century. And so many of us around the world think that, um, well, sustainable development, it just sounds so great. Isn't it about recycling and creative reuse and, uh, and creating energy and food resources for everyone? And the answer is no, it really is not. It's about moving populations into city centers, concentrated city centers, and clearing them out of the rural areas. So I became, um, I found out about it um, in a very unusual way, actually, because uh, I spent my career as a legal uh, witness, as an expert witness for the California Department of Transportation. I'm an expert in land use and land valuation, and uh, my specialty is in eminent domain valuation. So, of course, I was valuing property for the government so that the government could acquire that property for road projects. And what I found about 10 years ago, uh, around, uh, or 10 or 13 years ago, uh, was that land actually, it was very difficult to say what it was worth because you couldn't know what people could do with it because they were being restricted from using their property. And as I explored that and found that it wasn't just in the San Francisco Bay Area where, uh, where I was working, it was in fact all across the nation and the world, I looked behind that and I found United Nations Agenda 21, Sustainable Development. We created the Post Sustainability Institute uh, in order to educate people about the economic, social, political, and environmental impacts of communitarianism on the world. And communitarianism is that, uh, that concept, that uh, social and political construct that says that the individual's rights should be balanced against the rights of the community. And of course, the community is that amorphous, uh, undefined community that we, you know, when we talk about community, we think we're, of course, part of it and that, you know, it's a positive thing. But really, community is, uh, is constructed. It's constructed of non-governmental organizations, corporations, and government in order to dictate and regulate what it is that happens uh, around the world. And we, as individuals, have literally no influence on that unless we are in agreement with it. If you dissent against the community, against communitarian law or against communitarian uh, social tactics, you're rejected and, uh, and basically uh, made a, an outcast. And that is something that, uh, that we wanted to expose to the world. And the reason that, uh, that we created the Post Sustainability Institute was in order to sue um, we sued our, our local government, and right now we're suing uh, up higher up in order to stop regional plans because regionalization is the stepping stone to globalization, and globalization is the standardization of all systems. So that includes uh, water, law enforcement, uh, education, energy. All systems have to be brought into harmony in order to control them all. Because when systems don't meet, when they're, when they're out of balance or not in sync with one another, they can't be controlled centrally. And the goal of Agenda 21 is one world government and total control from a central unit. America, the United States of America is really under attack right now. We uh, in the United States are, uh, well the U.S. landmass is about two and a half times the size of Europe and has uh, roughly half the population, uh, just over half. Uh, that land mass is huge, and about 75% of the population lives in large cities. The goal is to move everyone out of 
the, uh, the rural areas and into the large cities and to destroy representative government and uh, to move it into um, to a more uh, to government by unelected boards and commissions. Now here in the EU, of course, you have you know you've already moved to that position where uh, it's an erasure of jurisdictional boundaries, an erasure of uh, national boundaries. And that is the goal because, as the big new Brzezinski said in 1995, um, you can't just impose globalization uh, pell-mell uh, as a total uh, movement. You have to do it incrementally, and the way to do that is through regionalization. And in Denmark, um, for instance, in Denmark, well, every nation that signed on to Agenda 21 has its, uh, its local Agenda 21 plan. And people in the United States are completely unaware of this. If I go out and talk about this, the United States press will attacks me and calls me a conspiracy theorist, which is it's totally ridiculous. It is a conspiracy, but it's not a theory. It's a fact. Uh, here in Europe, um, it's openly spoken about, lo Local Agenda 21, and of course here in Denmark, uh, the Aalborg uh, Principles, uh, 2000, excuse me, 1994, and then Aalborg Plus 10, 2004, uh, was the uh, European Roundtable for uh, Local Agenda 21, was held here, and the principles are public-private partnerships, which is fascism. And this is how it's implemented. Uh, on the ground is through this joining together between corporations, non-governmental uh, organizations, and governments in order to cut out the you know the actual individual, your voter, and instead to take that to a level where we literally cannot penetrate. And this is the goal. So this is already far progressed in Europe. The three pillars of United Nations Agenda 21 are economy, ecology, and equity, the three E's, the so social equity. And everyone sort of thinks that they know what that means, the idea of social equity. It must mean that, well, everyone's going to have access to clean water and clean air, and uh, no one's uh, property is going to be used as a dumping ground because they are at a poverty level. But really what social equity is about is about impoverishing huge portions of the population and bringing down uh, develop the developed nations. And while this sounds like, you know, it, it sounds almost like a, uh, in the United States you'd call that a right-wing point of view, a conservative right-wing point of view. I personally am a liberal. Um, the idea that uh, that's something this this drastic, this radical, would be happening worldwide without people knowing it. Um, all you have to do is look at austerity measures, restrictions on uh, transfers of, uh, of wealth, um, additional restrictions on land use, ability uh, you know, to, to produce, to, ha to use your, your energy, your water, your industry. All of this is happening in developed nations. So uh, when you have your infrastructure attacked like that, it's actually it's going to have a tremendous impact on your ability to to prosper, as well as the idea that um, that everything that we're looking at now is destined to collapse our economies, because the idea what you know this is a corporatocracy. It's a totalitarian state to being developed right now all over the world, and what major corporations want in this fascist development is to be able to uh, to have move, full movement of of, uh, of workers without borders or boundaries, to be able to move their goods through without regulations, and to reduce wages. And so this is the goal. So this is what you find with social equity. That's code for social equity for, for this movement and reduction of the population. So, uh, and of course, economy and uh, ecology is about um, bringing into balance uh, economy, these are the three circles, economy, ecology, and social equity. And where they meet in the center is balance. But really that balance is a communitarian balance. So it's not balance of well-being of the people. What it is is it's a balance for corporations so that they can exploit and control and have populations in an area, in tightly packed, dense areas, so that they can be surveilled and managed. And this is what that balance looks like as far as the development of a totalitarian state is. I think it's very important to know that the people now still have an opportunity to fight. All of us across the world understand that our individuality is at stake here. 
our most important private property is our body. And of course, surveillance is a vital part. Surveillance, uh, domestic surveillance and control is a vital part of this plan. It is a totalitarian plan. But, you know, just like uh, any other extreme plan, we are, uh, while we are moving towards the end game, we are not there. And this is the opportunity that all of us have now to stand up, to speak out, to refuse to collaborate, to refuse to cooperate, to expose collaborators, to work together to defund these plans, to refuse to, uh, to demand what it is the corporations want to give us. And so, uh, because no one's holding a gun to our heads right now, we have that opportunity. If that, if that changes, if that moment changes, you certainly won't protest then. So now is the time. And people all over the world are doing this. It's just that the mainstream media is owned by five major corporations, and you're not going to get this information from the mainstream press. So you need to be your own press. You need to educate yourself. You need to get out there and educate your neighbors, your community, your real community. You need to help your children understand that they're being indoctrinated from pre-kindergarten to post-graduate school. All of us have a responsibility to ourselves and to others. This is true community, to work for personal freedom. And always remember that even though we work as a group, if we do work as a group, we're all individuals in those groups. And we answer only to ourselves. And this is essential. It's essential as, as, as free human beings, this is what we are. We are free and we need to continue to be free. And I do believe that we will win, but we have to become aware that there is a fight and then make our friends and our neighbors and our community aware as well and work together. Right now in the United States, uh, we are moving into uh, major, massive regionalization. The United States has 50 states and it's divided into cities, counties, and states, and then the federal government. Instead, Agenda 21 is top down. It's global, regional, neighborhood, and none of those positions is elected. So in the United States right now, where uh, the development of regionalization is happening very quickly. It's happening with federal funding. There are hundreds of millions of dollars going to local governments in order to have them create regional plans. And what those do is they, this plan cannot be accomplished without control of land and land use. Because, of course, where you live often dictates the kind of life you're going to have. So regionalization takes away our opportunity to have an impact. It takes away representative government. So what we are doing at the Post Sustainability Institute right now is we are suing to stop the biggest regional plan in the United States and it is a blueprint for the rest of the country. What this plan is doing is essentially saying that no new development will happen anywhere but in 4% of the San Francisco Bay Area, that all 101 cities and 9 counties will be joined together and all land use decisions will be made basically by an unelected board. What this will do to land use and land value in the San Francisco Bay Area, to movements of people, to development of business, to freedom, is unfathomable and people are not aware of it. The only thing that is standing between that and full passage is our lawsuit. Now, um, what this truly means is if you tell people that they have to build only smart growth, high density development in an urban center right on a train line, or the train doesn't have to be there, it's the proposed idea of a train line, and then no development, no buildings, no residential, no commercial can happen outside of that very, very concentrated area. Then what do you have? You have a concentration camp of the future.
This is exactly what it looks like. And you see, it's very much more subtle and much more sophisticated than it was when the Nazis were doing it. You are not going to get thrown on a train car. You will just have your, uh, your roads out in the rural areas pulverized and turned to gravel. You'll have your family well monitored. You will have your energy restricted. You will have your, uh, your, your school service cut, your, uh, your sheriff service cut. You will find that you are not able to get your goods to market, and then you have to move into the city, and then you will move into this high-density development that is subsidized with our property tax dollars, and pretty soon you will have the Wildlands Project which is predicated on moving people out of the rural areas. And this is how it happens. So, um, you know, people say, well, hey, nobody's getting me off my land. Well, it's very easy. You know, no one's going to come to your door with a gun, but they will move you off your land and you will be in the cities. And those cities will be full capability of surveillance, monitoring, and control. These buildings, these high density buildings, are being built with a concept of eyes on the street you become basically a deputized police adjunct. Your job is to watch the street. Your job is to watch your neighbor. The, the war on terror is a war on you. And we all know this. We feel it. This is why we need to stop it. So this is our plan, is to use the courts at this point and stop this plan. And we're working on it.